Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's great to see so many faces. Uh, my name is Samir Jaywant. I'm a first year student at the law school, and I'm one of the academic associates that helped to organize the symposium today. Uh, we're very excited to host Mr. Jean Charest uh, here to give the keynote uh, address for this symposium. Mr. Charest will speak uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then that will be followed by a Q&A session with the audience. So today's symposium was entitled, Does Quebec Need a Written Constitution? And it brought together scholars from around the US and Canada to discuss the political and legal complexities around the question of whether Quebec can or should have its own written constitution. Now, the symposium today was organized and convened by uh, Professor Richard Albert. Uh, professor Albert is an associate professor of law at Boston College School of Law. And for this academic year, he's been a visiting associate professor of law and the Canadian bicentennial visiting professor of political science here at Yale University. Uh, Professor Albert's research focuses primarily on constitutional change and constitutional amendment and examines that from a variety of legal perspectives. Uh, he's written extensively about Canadian law and Canadian constitutional law and uh, a fellow, a, a native Canadian and, and a Yale Law School alum, Professor Albert clerked for the Chief Justice of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin, before uh, beginning his career in academia. And uh, so I would just say that this whole symposium was his brainchild and, uh, you know, would not have come together were it not for him. So uh, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Professor Richard Albert. One of the great joys of teaching here at Yale University is the opportunity to work alongside so many wonderful people from staff to faculty and to students. It really is a very special community. And I think that Samir represents the very best of Yale, a brilliant student, an advocate for social progress, and an engaged citizen in our campus life. And I have to say that I'm humbled uh, as his professor because in his presence, I'm often reminded of how little I know and how much I still have yet to learn. So thank you, Samir, for that introduction. It's uh, an honor for me and a pleasure to be here to introduce our keynote speaker, Jean Charest. His visit to Yale has been a long time coming, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. But first, I want to thank the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale for supporting this program. I want to recognize the Research Support Program on Intergovernmental Affairs and Quebec Identity, the Quebec U.S. University Grant Program, and also the Howard R. Lamar Center for the Study of Frontiers and Borders here at Yale. I want to thank all of them. Uh, they've been very supportive, generous in uh, showing that Canada matters here uh, at Yale. Uh, they care about Canada, they care about Canadian studies, and it's, it's a pleasure to be associated with them. I want to thank a number of individuals in addition to the institutions that I've recognized. I want to recognize uh, Patrick Bowe and Leonid Sirota, who have worked with me from the beginning to conceive this program, so thank you to Leonid and Patrick. I want to thank Marianne Bonnard and José Bergeron for being with me from the very beginning to help think through how to put this program together. To a number of individuals, Rahima Chowdhury, Lena Chan, Lourdes Haynes, Marilyn Wilkes, Ian Shapiro, George Joseph for supporting Canadian studies here at Yale. And also to David Cameron and Jay Gitlin uh, who are on the Canadian Studies Committee here at Yale. Uh, for championing Canadian studies here at the university. And finally, I want to recognize the presidents of Marie-Claude Francoeur, Quebec delegate to New England, for being here with us today. Thank you very much for your presence. It's, a, it's lovely to have you here with us today. All day today across the street at Luce Hall, leading scholars in law and political science have been gathered for a conference to debate a provocative and important question. Does Quebec need a written constitution, a master text codified constitution? Invited scholars have explored the idea of a Quebec constitution within a Canadian constitutional framework. We've approached the question from doctrinal, from historical, from theoretical perspectives. And we've also looked around the world to other federations where provinces, states, and lender have given themselves written constitutions within a larger federal 
system. So we've covered a lot of ground today on the question of a constitution for Quebec. Our keynote speaker for today will both clarify and I think also complicate our understanding of the stakes involved in whether Quebec does in fact need a written constitution. As the 29th Premier of Quebec from 2003 to 2012, Jean Charest and his cabinet considered the question, the possibility of giving Quebec a written constitution. So who better to speak to the question we've explored today as a matter of political and legal theory than someone who has devoted considerable time and resources to evaluating whether it is in fact a viable idea. Jean Charest, a lawyer, elected to the House of Commons at age 26, becoming the youngest federal cabinet minister in Canadian history, re-elected three times, later named Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. An amazing record of service, I'm sure you'll agree, to Canada. But I think he would say that what brings him pride above all else is that he is son of Claude and Rita, husband to Michelle, and father of Amélie, Antoine, and Alexandra. Almost 20 years ago, in 1997, I was here at Yale as a student, finishing my freshman year. And I returned home to Canada that summer, to Orleans, where I was raised. And at that time, Jean Charest was leading his federal political party into an election. I had begun following Jean Charest very, very closely a few years earlier, when he had successfully rallied support behind Canada and against the threat of Quebec's secession from the country in the 1995 referendum. A loyal and tireless Federalist, he had served then as the Vice Chair of the National Committee of Quebecers against secession. And many, in fact, credit him, among a handful of very important political leaders at the time, for helping to keep Quebec within Canada. And so in 1997, when I returned home to Canada, I campaigned for him and his team. Over the next couple of years, when I came back to Yale to complete my studies, we tried to get him to join us on campus for a visit. We came very close, very, very close, but the timing was difficult because by then he had left federal politics to come back home to lead the Quebec Liberal Party in the National Assembly to continue the fight, as it were, on the front lines for a strong Quebec within a united Canada. Soon thereafter, he was elected Premier of Quebec, his home province and also mine, and he was later re-elected twice, serving from 2003 to 2012, a tenure of service marked by accomplishments in economic growth and diversification, environmental protection, and gender equality, among a number of others. Two years ago, I once again ran into Jean Charest, but this time it was at the Calgary Stampede. He was almost unrecognizable in his cowboy hat and boots, almost unrecognizable. And there we spoke and we planted the seed for this program today. And so here we are today with Jean Charest finally at Yale, a few years later than I had hoped, about 19 years later than I had hoped, but here nonetheless, proving to me and now also to you that all good things do indeed come to those who wait. So Jean Charest, we welcome you to Yale University. We look forward to your remarks today. Thank you, Richard. That was a, a very kind introduction, and uh, the Calgary Stampede part in particular, for those of us who, uh, who know about uh, Alberta and the West. I do want to acknowledge the presence of Marie-Claude Francaire, who uh, I had the pleasure of working with for a number of years in my government, and was delighted when she accepted the position of Délégué Général du Québec in Boston, and uh, had a short period of uh, time off, and then returned to this job. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. And Ted Morton also, who had the pleasure of working with. Ted mentioned uh, in his presentation a little earlier across the street that he had worked very closely with Raymond Bachin, which I remember very well, and about the relationship between Alberta and Quebec that we can talk about today, which I think is a very important part of what uh, makes up the dynamic in the, uh, in the Canadian uh, Federation. So. Uh, and before I start my remarks today, I want to thank two people who have helped me prepare them uh, because there is always a lot of work to do. There's Francois Corbeil who's with me today, uh, 
who's a uh, an articling, uh, I shouldn't say student with me, he's doing a master's degree at Sherbrooke University in international law and politics and has been working with me. He's also a lawyer. And so he's done a, a lot of work in preparing uh, notes for today, as my son Antoine that you mentioned a little earlier, who did a, a master's at LSC and is very interested in political philosophy and uh, and is now doing a doctorate at the University of Montreal and very interested in the issues rela in relation to identity and the work of Charles Taylor. And to share an anecdote about Antoine, he was very active in the Youth Commission of the Liberal Party of Quebec. So those of you who are familiar with Quebec politics will know it's, it's a very, very dynamic youth group. And a lot of the leaders who are in the assembly come up through that youth commission. And so one day, as I'm premier, I walk out the door at home and I'm handed the newspaper with a front page story saying that I'm denounced by my youth commission on the issue of multiculturalism, that uh, the premier doesn't understand that we should be applying interculturalism as a concept, and it goes on, and I have a few media events that day. I get plummeted by the media that day because the youth commission is opposed to the leader. And so I return home that night at dinner. My son is there, and I'm frustrated. I say to him, did you see what your, your group did today? Did you, did you see the paper? He said, yes, I did. I wrote the paper. <laughs> he was the author of this. Uh, and he told me, he said, you, you never understood this issue anyway. And I was, uh, so it does give you a sense of the discussions we have at home. I, I, uh, I accepted uh, your invitation in, in part because uh, not only was it a, something that I, I wanted to do 19 years later, but also the context is an interesting context. Where there's not a lot of discussion about constitutional issues today in Quebec or in Canada, and there's a reason for that. There's a context around that. But also there's a more recent event that, uh, that gave me a lot of cause for, for concern, and that was when the Parti Québécois was in power, and Madame Marois brought forward this idea of a charter of rights and a charter and shout of identity charter. Very controversial and uh, something that uh, frankly I found to be offensive for only, if only for one reason. It was one of the first, I think it was the first time that I witnessed the separatist movement in Quebec deliberately devise a policy with the view of opposing one group against the other. Now, the separatist movement in Quebec, and I'm not saying they have a monopoly on, on this, neither do the, sep the Federalists, had from time to time would do things, say statements that would be very divisive, as Jacques Parizeau did on the night of the referendum campaign when they lost. Statement from which he never recanted, by the way. He never apologized. He never said, I was wrong and I should not have said it. And uh, that left a very profound mark on a number of Quebecers. But when Madame Marois' charter of values was proposed with a, a view of dividing people, one of the questions that came to mind was, could this happen had there been a Quebec charter, a Quebec constitution, or how would this charter, for example, be tested against the Quebec Bill of Rights that Bourassa brought in in 1974? And so the question of the implementation, the respect of rights, how they're enunciated, how we use them was asked in that context and and it's one of the reasons why I thought this discussion is is important and certainly interesting. My political career as you know has all been has been about Canada and about Quebec within Canada. The common thread of everything I've done over the years has been in reference to uh, fighting for the ideal of Canada and the fact that Quebec should be part of it and in fact without Quebec Canada as a country I'm not sure would survive. That being said, I want to start by, uh, by saying that I was also very involved early in my career on these issues. When I was named to cabinet in 1986 at 28 years old, I was also named to the cabinet committee on preparing the Meech Lake negotiations that were not known as Meech Lake at the time. All we knew was that as an ad hoc cabinet committee, our job, and it was chaired by Lowell Murray at the time, who was the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, was to prepare the groundwork for a meeting that would be held between the Prime Minister of Canada and the Premiers on the issue of our constitutional future and the integration of, uh, of Quebec. And so that was my first jab at, at this issue in a formal way. It was followed by two other important episodes I wanted to speak to today. One was chairing the special 
House of Commons Committee on the Companion Resolutions to the Meech Lake Accords that were delivered in the spring of 1990 with a view of trying to fix the Meech Lake Accord to make it acceptable to those who had objections. A very, very intense period in the life of the country. And the third episode for me after that was 1998. Of course, there was a Charlottetown Accord I campaigned for, but 1998. And in 1998, I uh, campaigned as a leader of the Liberal Party of Quebec. And the issue in that campaign in the end, the issue we made in the end, was no referendum. I remember it very well because the campaign was not going well at all. And Lucien Bouchard's plan in 1998 was very straightforward. He would win a new majority government and hold another referendum. And he was very powerful and, tra and char charismatic. And the uh, chances of him winning that referendum were very, very high. Well, we dedicated the whole last chapter of our election campaign fighting that idea and turned it into two new words, no referendum. On the night of the election, Lucien Bouchard won a the majority of the seats. We won a plurality of the votes. And Lucien admits to this today that his project of holding another referendum disappeared on that evening. I tell that story to those uh, who I speak to sometimes about politics when I want to refer to an example when a defeat is sometimes more important than victory. Of all the election campaigns I was involved in, the 98 campaign was the most important one. Not the one I won, the one I lost. But having lost, it, lost that campaign that way, it allowed the country breathing space to go on and fight another day. So I've had a chance over the years to think about these issues and to explore the idea of a Quebec uh, referendum. We, uh, when I became leader of the Liberal Party of Quebec in 1998 with Benoit Pelletier that was referred to this morning, was an extraordinarily competent uh, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and an expert on constitutional law. He teaches at Ottawa University. We put together a special working group within the Liberal Party of Quebec to prepare what our position would be on intergovernmental relations, large. And one of the orientations that we proposed coming out of that working group was that Quebec would work at developing and further developing its relationship, not only with Ottawa, but also with the rest of the country. One of the things that we believed and continue to believe, I continue to believe is, underutilized and underexplored and is the relationship between the provinces and not just Quebec versus Ottawa. From that uh, paper came the idea of the creation of the Council of the Federation, of la, le Centre de, Francophone, de Francophonie des Amériques that was since created, the recognition of asymmetrical federalism, etc. And so in that particular paper, uh, in that committee, chaired by Benoit Pelletier, were born these, uh, these ideas. I want to return to uh, the, uh, the period of Meech Lake, though, and one of the great lessons of Meech Lake itself. And there are a few things that emerged from that episode that I thought were worth uh, returning to. One of them is an important misunderstanding that emerged from the goal of Meech Lake. The goal from the perspective of the federal government and the government of Quebec was to complete the repatriation of our constitution by allowing Quebec to sign it. Not to bring more fundamental changes to the constitution of Canada. Not a redistribution of power. But rather to complete the process that had not been completed in 1982. Now, the other the other thing that I drew from the experience of, 19, uh, of this uh, 1990 uh, process, 1987 to 90, was the fact that the strategy of implementation of the Meech Lake Accord was also defective. There was the alignment between the strategy to implement and the content had not been thought through. Why? Well. I think because the leaders of the time assumed a number of things that ended up being wrong. One of them was that the process should take three years. 
when in fact, had they known what they were getting into, they would have moved much more expeditiously to get the work done. Why? Because the three-year period allowed opponents to organize and to mobilize public opinion against the accord. The reason why I raise this is because any work done in regards to constitutional change, if we draw from that experience, requires that there be an alignment between the amending, the content, and implementation. In fact, if I had to give advice to those who are thinking of amending or doing constitutional work, I would start by telling them, tell me first, before you even get into the discussion on what it is you want to change, on how it is you are going to change it. And if you cannot give me a clear path that leads us to implementation, then I would recommend that you not, especially not deal with this issue. Keeping in mind that when you deal with the constitution of a country, it's like dealing or changing the foundations of a house, of a building. It's not like changing a wall in a room, which would be similar to typical standard legislation. A constitution is the bedrock, the foundation of the country. It speaks not only to the law and the fundamental law, but it also speaks to something that you referred to earlier in your discussions today in regards to identity and who we are. Now let me say a word about Canada. Uh, things you already know, but I want to repeat because it is very relevant to anything that has to do with the constitutional discussion in Canada, whether provincial constitutions or otherwise. We are, in Canada, one of the most decentralized federations in the world. A lot of work has been done about this, but the work I saw is very much on the ground. I remember doing a press conference with Arthur Mas, who until very recently was the president of Cat Catalonia, who I met several times, and in the privacy of his office said to me, Jean, if I had the powers that Quebec had, I'd take that today. That deal, I would accept it today, and we would be perfectly happy. And I thought to myself, that's great. He says that to me in the privacy of his office. And then we held a press conference, and he repeated the same thing publicly. If you go to Scotland, for example, and look at the devolution of powers that the Blair government gave to the government of Scotland, there is no comparison in regards to the powers that we have in Quebec. If you go to Australia, for example, same thing in terms of fiscal power in particular. And the United States, I would venture to say. The Canadian provinces have much more power than any other federation I know, except probably Belgium, whose system of federal government no one understands anyway. <laughs> Bernard Landry, as Premier of Quebec, once made a very surprising statement. He said Quebec had more powers than most sovereign countries most sovereign countries. And when you look at our fiscal or constitutional framework in Canada, how does, it, how does it work essentially? I'm going to simplify here, and I was talking about this earlier with Professor Wiseman, but essentially in Canada it's the provinces who run the country. Education, health care, the roads, civil law, the provinces run the country. On a day-to-day -day basis we make it work. The federal government is like a holding. They transfer money. If you want to measure it, go and look at the last federal budget. Look at the percentage of money dedicated to operating the government of Canada, including salaries. I don't, I'm guessing it may not be higher than 20%. In the government of Quebec alone, 60% of the budget is dedicated to salaries. Only salaries. 60%. It's the governments of the provinces that run the country. The federal government transfers money. They run federal penitentiaries. They run, they're responsible for First Nations, for which we all agree they're doing a fantastic job. They are in charge of part of foreign policy, but not exclusively. Marie-Claude is evidence of that. The Bank of Canada. But what the federal government has in particular the real power it has that's significant is spending power. 
money. That's at the end of the day. Whether it's the power of reserve or debt, at the end of the day, where the government of Canada is significant is in its ability to raise taxes and spend money and to tie conditions to what they, uh, they do. Canada also is a country that is founded by the French, the English, and First Nations. Multi-ethnic, multinationalist, however you want to call it, as a federation that also distinguishes who we are. And the vast territory that we occupy and the fact that we have a small population base is relevant to who we are also. So you have to take our constitutional discussions in that context. One of the things I wanted to also speak to and it was raised in the part of the discussions I witnessed is that context is everything in this discussion. Of course it is. Yes, the word constitution doesn't resonate or mean the same thing in one environment than it does in another. And in Canada, it is not transactional. If Daniel Turp rises in the National Assembly of Quebec and proposes a constitution for Quebec, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that for him, this is the antechamber of separating Quebec from Canada. And they will even say to the Federalist, as they've said, well, you know, this is done within the Canadian framework. What are you worried about? But what they are really trying to accomplish from our perspective is create forward momentum that allows them to advance the discussion. And I'll give you an idea of how it connects to process. In 2016, is there anyone who thinks that Quebec could adopt a constitution and not hold a referendum? Well, I don't think it's possible. I think the only way you could adopt a constitution in Quebec is hold a referendum. Well, guess what? What will Daniel Turp say then? He'll say that it's perfect. Referendum's about choice. We have to give them a choice. If you're only offering the Constitution, then you, it's not a real choice, really, is it? You have to offer separation or the Constitution. Now put yourself in my shoes to speak of the real politics of a Quebec Constitution. For 30 years, I have fought tooth and nail for the ideal of Canada and Quebec within Canada. And I have been a wartime general in referendums in 95 and 92 and the 98 campaign. And I have campaigned saying to Quebecers, no referendum, realistically. If I were Premier of Quebec and I proposed a constitution and said to Quebecers, we're going to have a referendum, could you blame them for being confused? Do you think that I could overcome that confusion with a public opinion who for the last 30 years has heard me say no referendum. Can I win that battle? That would be one of the first questions I would have to ask myself. And I think most of you probably have an idea of whether or not I could win that battle. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is quite separate from the idea of whether or not a constitution in itself would be good or bad. Frankly, on many matters, there are very solid, rational arguments to be made on having a good, written, provincial constitution. Back to Madame Marois' ploy and the separatist ploy to invoke, and by the way, it, very deliberately, knowing, for example, that their charter would be disallowed by the courts, which would then create an environment or a flashpoint that would feed resentment against the federal government leading to a referendum. That's how clear it was. They deliberately did something that legislators are never supposed to do, is vote laws that you know to be contrary to the rule of law in your country for the purpose of creating a political debate that you hope you can win. Had we had maybe a written constitution that brought under one single umbrella different laws that have been mentioned, I suppose, this morning, whether it's our Quebec 
Charte des droits et libertés, ou notre, and the French language of Charter of Rights, the French Charter, and or electoral law, and other pieces of legislation, we may have been able to prevent that or make a stronger case against it or create a public environment that would have been more hostile and more easy to mobilize against such a blatant use of our laws for the purpose of advancing the cause of separation. Maybe. The other argument you could make is that if Quebec had its own written constitution, it would allow Quebecers to reinforce and further secure their sense of identity, which will always be an issue. Quebecers sometimes see themselves as a majority within Quebec, which they are, and other times as a minority within Canada and a minority within North America. Any government of Quebec, any premier of Quebec, is, is tasked with the mission to protect our language and culture. It is a sacred mission that is invested in every single premier of Quebec so that they can allow this unique language and culture to continue to thrive within North America and the world. And so in that respect, maybe a Quebec constitution could be helpful could reinforce that sense of identity, which is an integral, integral part of any constitution making. As we learn from the distinct society clause in the Meech debate, there was a revelation moment for me when I was chair of the committee and for members of the committee when Charles Taylor testified in front of our committee and explained to the members of the committee why the distinct society clause was so important to Quebecers. And he said something in words we had never heard before, but were so simple to understand. He said to us, today, for Quebecers, the distinct society clause is a bridge between their identity as being both a Quebecer and a Canadian. It is a bridge. If you blow up that bridge, you weaken that relationship. He presented it to us the best. And so when the debate evolved on Meech Lake in that period, and it's the same for any constitutional, I would say, debate in Canada, and outside of Quebec, the debate focused on technical issues, legal issues, some relevant, some not, and in Quebec it was an issue of identity. Identity that you should interpret as synonymous to respect, recognition. What is identity about for any given group? Two words, recognition and respect. Am I recognized? Am I respected for who I am? By the way, there are very real similarities in that dynamic with what is happening today with First Nations in Canada the quest and their thirst for recognition and respect, which is part of what any minority seeks to feel at home and able to thrive. And so if a Quebec constitution were ever contemplated, this could be, if the circumstances were right, one of the positive outcomes of drafting such a document. But I want to return to what I was saying a little earlier. The circumstances would have to exist for that discussion to happen. Will it happen? All of us who care about the future of Canada hope that it will one day happen, that there will be a moment or circumstances in which governments in Canada can lead on this issue and say, we need to fix our Constitution of 82. That maybe drafting provincial constitutions is part of it. You could envisage a scenario, for example, where the rest of the country, after Quebec would have drafted its own written constitution, would embrace that constitution. As opposed to saying, we're going to recognize this or that, say, I will recognize 
what you have drafted. You could do it through section maybe 43 or otherwise. You know more about the technical part of that than I do. But I don't see that day on our horizon right now. What I do know is this, which you haven't talked a lot about today, is that the federal system of, of government, whether it's in Canada or elsewhere, isn't only about the Constitution. A healthy, vigorous federal system of government evolves outside of its constitutional framework. And our view when I, we were in government, my view was that we should do everything in our power to allow that federal system to evolve in respect of the interests of Quebec and Canada. And if one day we are in a position to negotiate a new agreement, then we will have set the table to do that. So what did we do? We created the Council of Federation. We negotiated an agreement within, with the federal government on UNESCO, the participation of Quebec within UNESCO, and within the framework of the rules of UNESCO, went as far as we could to recognize Quebec as being part of that delegation. In 2004, we negotiated a health care agreement, and one of the conditions of signing the agreement from the perspective of Quebec was total respect of our autonomy in spending the money that was transferred unconditionally, A, and B, the recognition of the principle of asymmetric federalism that was formally put into the agreement and signed by every single premier who attended that conference, including the Prime Minister of Canada. During our mandate, the federal government of Canada recognized through a motion in the House of Commons that Quebec was a nation within Canada. During our mandate, for the first time ever, the federal government accepted, it had forced, partly forced upon it, the presence of provincial governments at the table to negotiate a major trade agreement, the Canada, the CETA agreement, the most advanced trade agreement in the world. And by the way, because the Europeans knew about our federal system of government, they said to the federal government, we will only negotiate if the provinces are at the table. If they're not at the table, we will not negotiate with you. The federal government at the time said to them, well, it's complicated, you know, it's tough. So why? Well, you know, there's 10 provinces and three territories and, you know, they all have their, and Europeans said to them, you know what? We have 27 sovereign nations. We can do it and you can't. Well, the outcome is one of the most, not one of the most, the most advanced trade agreement in the world. But put yourself in the shoes of Europe. Why would they negotiate a grade B trade agreement with Canada when it's the most decentralized federation in the world and the issues you want to address are issues like government procurement that happen within the competencies of the provinces, not the federal government? These are all the things that we were able to accomplish outside of a constitutional framework and that allows Canada to function more effectively as a country. And so today, as you see, I'm not giving you the answer, yes or no answer that you're looking for. Certainly, we can anticipate the day where this will happen. But as things stand now, I, uh, if I had to give advice to a government of Quebec, I would say maybe if the circumstances are right and if there is an alignment of process with content and leadership that speaks to how this will be done. But until that day appears, I would, uh, I would recommend that we continue to work with what we have. Thank you. So now we'll start the Q&A portion. Just uh, raise your hand and I'll come and give you the mic. Don't be shy. Uh, thank you. I think everybody in the room understands the risk of kind of opening the Pandora's box the minute uh, there's a referendum on anything in Quebec and uh, that the risk outweigh the benefits. I think you probably have a pretty receptive audience here. But uh, you heard the kind of the, 
the modest mini package I talked about uh, in the last panel uh, this afternoon. Um, is that is that small enough, minimal enough, uh, incremental enough to, to look at in the next uh, year or two in Quebec without running the the uh, the risk of the lid of the Pandora's box on identity politics coming out again? And, and Ted, if I were Alberta, I would prepare a scenario. And if I were the Premier of Alberta, I would be, I would say to my officials, prepare scenarios that would allow us to defend our interest within the Canadian framework, which isn't contrary to Canada's interest. And that would uh, would allow us to to advance. I, I do like there's a you know there's different approaches possible. There can be a minimalist approach that is not led by Quebec but led by someone outside of Quebec because after Meech Lake, people concluded that if it were again a Quebec-led initiative, that would contaminate the 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 process. And maybe if it came elsewhere. I'm guessing, I can only guess, you know what, I think it'll probably, if we have another round, it'll probably happen by accident, partly by accident. Something will break, something, a ruling will happen, and something will force the hand of those who are involved. Senate reform could have been that. An interesting, these issues with the leaders are interesting, by the way. I'll share an anecdote with you. I met with Stephen Harper several times when he was Prime Minister on Senate reform. We talked about it. And, and I'm not delivering any great secret here. I said to the Prime Minister several times, I, I don't know why you keep talking about Senate reform. You are proposing things that are not going to happen. In the last federal campaign in Canada, it was, a, it was very interesting. Federal leaders going out there and saying, we are going to abolish the Senate. We're going to abolish the Senate. And our media is so weak. No one calling. We have a recently, I mean, the ink isn't dry on the Supreme Court ruling that says, you can't do that. It is not allowed. And it, all, this ruling, by the way, is based on a 1979 Sup Supreme Court ruling. I, was saying to, I remember saying to Prime Minister Harper at the time, I, I don't know why you keep creating this expectation. We are going to bring you to court. I'm telling you now, if you do that, we're bringing you to court and we'll win. And we did bring him to court and we won, as we did with you on the uh, national regulators. And I, we told them that, saying the same thing, you are going to run into a brick wall. But sometimes the politics of it gets out of control. And so back to your question, if that were to happen, I'm not sure in what circumstances that window will open. But if I were in Alberta or elsewhere in the world, I'd like to have people that I could turn to who have given some thought on how that would. And I'll, I'll finish where I started my remarks, though. I would not trust anyone to go ahead with a process or a proposal if at first they couldn't tell me, how are you going to get this done? And there's one person in Canada and one province in Canada that implemented successfully uh, an amendment of this nature and who, uh, who we can draw a lesson from. And if you ask me the question, I'll tell you who it is, maybe. Okay, I'll tell you right away. You remember Brian Tobin's amendment on his confessional law schools? He proposed it and held the referendum 30 days after tabling it. Bang. The opposition never had a chance to. Now, I'm not saying it's the example to follow. What I'm saying in this specific case of Tobin is that he had a very clear idea of how he was going to implement it and how he would proceed. And if you don't have that, then I don't think you should, uh, anyone should be playing. That was with the delegation. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure. He won. He won. The second time. Well, Mr. Wiseman, I'll have to. Uh, my recollection that he's won. Did he do hold two referendums? How could he hold two referendums within uh, the same mandate of a parliament on the same issue? That's not allowed. Okay. Maybe someone knows the answer to that question here. You talked about the Scottish referendum. We, you know, with, Canadians were widely consulted on that. And it was fascinating to see how they followed the same. Uh, and on the Scottish side, how it's the same. Uh, I would go to meetings, by the way, and see Alex Salmon. He would run across the aisle, you know, and not talk to me. And... Uh, but uh, it was the same. These referendums are based on emotion. It's never based on reason. 
And if, she, if, if that isn't fueling the, uh, the referendum, that's why the separatists are so, and Mr. Turp and others are, I think, so determined to push uh, an agenda like this. And that's, that is their agenda, which we have to separate from the basic merits of whether or not there should be a constitutional written, a written constitution. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I'll, you've had a long day. Thank you very, very much. And we hope to uh, see you in Quebec. I'll finish with one anec small anecdote on the nation and how it happened. Mr. Harper came to uh, Quebec in, on the 24th of June, 2006, hold a cabinet meeting. He'd just been elected. Thought this was a great idea. And André Boisclair was the leader of the Parti Québécois at the time. And he challenged Mr. Harper. He said to him, since you're in Quebec City and you want to be, you know, why don't you recognize Quebec as a nation? Do it now. I met with Mr. Harper that evening. And on that evening, I quoted, I gave him my favorite quote of Sir John A. Macdonald. Sir John A. Macdonald wrote to a journalist of the Montreal Gazette in 1860, I think it was 1864, uh, answering the question of why did you accept the federal pact as opposed to a more unitary system of government? And talking about Quebecers, he was talking about French Canadians, he said, treat them as a nation. That's the word he chose. Treat them as a nation and they will behave as the people of a nation do in a generous. Treat them as a faction and they will behave factiously. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but that is the most important quote I know of Sir John A. Macdonald. And I said to Stephen Harper on that evening, I said, if the first of prime minister of our country was able to recognize Quebec as being a nation, why would you want to contradict him today? And, uh, and I think Sir John A. was right. So thank you very much.